Thank you. It is my honor to introduce our distinguished panel members who will frame tonight's discussion. After a brief introduction, we will dive into tonight's session. First, we would like to extend a warm welcome to Colonel Heather Blackwell. Colonel Blackwell is the Director of Cyberspace and Information Dominance and the Chief Information Officer, Headquarters Air Combatant Command, Joint Base Langley, Eustis, Virginia. She leads a staff in three subordinate units responsible for delivering strategic and enterprise level cyberspace efforts to increase the U.S. Air Force's ability to provide combat forces to combatant commanders. Colonel Blackwell provides the strategic vision, policy, guidance, and advocacy to drive the engineering and integration to build, extend, operate, secure, and defend the Air Force portion of the Department of Defense global network. She is responsible to organize, train, and equip cyberspace capability and communications for the command's 35 wings, 1,000 aircraft, 12 bases, and 242 worldwide operating locations with 156,739 total force military personnel. Next, we would like to welcome Mrs. Sandy Person. Ms. Person brings over 35 years in economic development experience to our, the Countrywide Economic Development Organization. Ms. Person has worked for Solano EDC for over 20 years and served as its president and CEO from 2011 to 2018. She transitioned into her current role as executive director for the Travis Community Consortium in 2018 to focus on Travis Air Force Base advocacy and defense industry initiatives for Travis Air Force Base and the Air Force. We also have Dr. William Rowe, Jr. Dr. Rowe has nearly 40 years of professional experience in government, consulting, and academia. He provides market leadership for headquarters, Department of Defense, and civilian agency, environmental, energy, and facility-related programs. Dr. Rowe currently leads Booz Allen Hamilton's infrastructure, energy, and environmental function community and plays a cross-cutting role in supporting infrastructure and environment business opportunities in domestic and international markets. Previously, he had led roles for the Office of the Secretary of Defense, the U.S. Air Force, U.S. Navy, U.S. Marine Corps, the U.S. Army, and the Department of Interior Markets. Finally, Dr. Rowe helps lead cross-cutting business initiatives within Booz Allen, Allen Hamilton, including public-private partnerships, military test and training ranges, water infrastructure and security, and base realignment and closure. We would like to also extend a warm welcome to Mr. Carlton Reed. Mr. Reed is an enterprise thought leader and change agent consulting to the U.S. government. Mr. Reed served 30 years in the United States Army, retiring at the rank of colonel. He provided a strong leadership of large, complex organizations to include a brigade task force in Iraq from 2005 to 2006, the height of the Iraqi Civil War period. Additionally, Mr. Reed worked as senior levels of the executive officer and principal military assistant to the deputy undersecretary of the Army and as the chief of staff of the Defense Threat Reduction Agency. He expanded counterintelligence and security measures to contend with post-WikiLeaks insider threats, modernized NATO, NATO stabilization, and the American, British, Canadian, and Australian armies program. Finally, Mr. Reed led, led U.S.-Russia implementation of the Plutonium Production Reactor Agreement inspections and taught physics at the United States Military Academy, West Point, New York. <laughs> We would like to welcome Mrs. Katara Johnson-Jones. Mrs. Johnson-Jones is a highly sought speaker and trainer for state agencies, schools, businesses, hospitals, and municipal organizations. In addition to working at her own firm, she also serves as the Chief Human Resource Officer at the second largest behavioral health organization in the Inland Northwest. As a former Chief Diversity Officer for a large complex organization, Mrs. Johnson-Jones managed and supported strategic organizational development, health equity outcomes, community health partnerships, and training. She was awarded the top 100 Chief Diversity Officers in the United States in April of 2021 by the National Diversity Council and was a presenter at the National Diversity and Leadership Conference. Finally, Mrs. Johnson-Jones earned her master's in organizational leadership and management at Webster's University, a Bachelor of Applied Science degree in Workforce Education and Development, and her Associates of Applied Science degree in Early Childhood Education and Development, and a graduate of Cornell University's Diversity and Inclusion for Human Resources Certificate Program. Finally, we would like to welcome Dr. Rana Sage. Dr. Sage is a resulted is a result-oriented corporate executive with over 20 years of experience and demonstrated success leading economic development, nonprofit, business, organizations, educational program excellence, community partnerships, and coalition building. Dr. Sake has led, in, has led nationwide teams and community military alliances with high impact results and a focus on diversity, 
equity, and inclusion. She has proven track record on working collaboratively to accomplish strategic regional objectives and simplifying complex challenges into actionable solutions. Finally, Dr. Sage is especially skilled in organizational growth and project development, establishing vision, setting strategic direction, enrolling key stakeholders, funding development, and translating strategy to successful action and outcomes. At this time, we'd like to turn it over to Colonel Blackwell, who will set the tone for tonight's discussion. Over to you, ma'am. So Heather, I have you unmuted, but I don't hear you. Still no sound yet, Heather. Check if you want to push and uh, we'll, we'll come back to that. She said in the chat, everyone that should, of course, sound is not working. I'll come out and come back in. It's going to be right. worth the wait. I know, right? So <laughs> what do you want to do, Steph? You want to push or? Um, Colonel Burks, I'm, I'm good with pushing. Let's push. Sir. She's setting the Sir. tone, though, I think. <laughs> Adams, if you don't mind, we talked about doing some things here. If we could just pop up the next series to give her time to come in, that's what I would recommend. But we'll go um, in whatever direction that you lead us over. And we can pop it up if, if she has something of an issue. That we can do. So let's bring up the next, let's bring up a slide that we have at the ball that's going to talk about our next session. Uh, so Quickly, everybody, what we're trying to do this month is focus on uh, military and the community. Um, this is our uh, second uh, event for the month of um, January. And I think you're gonna be pleased to uh, listen in and, and hear from our speakers today. And we will additionally um, focus in on the, the community there in Montgomery, Alabama. We know and understand they are doing a lot of uh, different and unique things. You can kind of see the lineup that we're working to, to bring in there. And once we get confirmation, we'll put the photos in and we'll share it on our Facebook page. Uh, and additionally, we'll share it with our email distribution group. If you are not, you know, on um, our email distribution, uh, you, can, you can do a screenshot of this and kind of grab our, um, our email address there, Crucial Conversation 0 at Gmail. I will add you to, um, to our group. So I'm letting Heather back in the room now. Uh, anything that I missed, uh, uh, Felicia, as far as what we got coming up next? Negative, sir. Thank you. Thanks for doing that. All right. We are devoting uh, January and February to talk about uh, community. And the reason we wanted to do that, and Heather, when you get on and come up my hot, I'll stop talking, but I'll keep talking until we get, you know, Heather up. But our purpose is to uh, focus on the community. We, the military, we draw um, about 70% of our military force from installations uh, and from communities that are close to our installations and also from our southern states. That, may, that represents like 70% of where we get our recruiting numbers from. So I believe it's important that we have a communication you know, avenue to try to make those communities better uh, from a recruiting standpoint and additionally from the standpoint of um, ensuring that we, uh, uh, that all of our airmen and guardians, wherever they are, it could be at any base, that them and their families have a great experience while they're stationed there from education to medical care uh, and just feel like they belong in the community. And so what we want to do is highlight some of the communities that are doing well. We had the Hill Air Force Base on uh, last crucial Convo uh, that talked about some of the things we're doing with some other installations as well. And so we want to highlight uh, Montgomery, Alabama um, for various different reasons. Uh, and I think that's going to be uh, very rewarding. Uh, Heather Blackwell, are you up? Can you hear us? 
I can hear you just fine, sir. Can you hear me okay? All right, so we got her in. Let's uh, push the Heather's. Oh, the floor is over to you, Heather. You heard me kind of give a, a kind of once over of what we're planning to do for our next session. You came from the AETC world, uh, so you kind of know it well, but we want to highlight the great things that are done at Keesler. Um, I was uh, I was there when the wing commander took down the Confederate flag. I mean, took down the, the, you know, the, the, the state flag there on the base for various different reasons. And so we know your time there, you did a lot of um, conversations with your wing internal to the base. You did a lot of things external uh, to the community. And we brought you on so you can highlight that. So the floor is over to you, Kelly. Yes, sir, thank you very much. Can you hear me okay this time? Got you loud and clear, thank you. So um, thank you for the wonderful introduction. It is not lost on me that you talk about all this cyber stuff and I'm the only person having camera problems and audio problems. So. I'm giving you guys a thumbs up and saying, oh my goodness, but I am excited to be here. So thank you for the opportunity. And yes, sir, you're right. Um, Keesler is, I have to say, since you guys talked about um, the 82nd being the first, the largest training wing, Keesler is the second, Air Force's second largest training wing. Um, and I was a wing commander down there during the um, you know, 2020, which was a crazy year, um, both from COVID to the worst hurricane season ever to um, the racial tensions. And so I'm happy to talk about um, any and all of the stuff that we did because our partnership with the community was absolutely critical. Um, mayor Fofo Gillich, uh, the mayor right there in Biloxi, his support um, during our time there was critical. Um, our senator's support um, was also uh, very critical. And I'll also mention um, the support that we got from the surrounding schools. We cannot deny um, how, how uh, amazing that was as well. Right outside the gate, um, they had a school that was Jeff Davis, uh, 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 elementary, and they changed um, the name of that school in 2020 um, during all of this a, as a way to show diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and, and again, this applies not just to um, the the um, the racial piece, but also to what we did for Native Americans, LGBTQ. Um, and I would love to answer questions on on uh, age and inclusion of our retiree and all our population there on the base. But um, confronting it directly um, and being very transparent was extremely important to us. And we could not have done that without the support of the community. I'll stop there, sir, and, and um, stand by for any questions later. Over. Hi, Colonel Blackwell, ma'am. Thank you so much. And certainly we have either read about you or saw you on YouTube videos talking about some of the work <laughs> and of course your name, <laughs> your reputation is solid. And so thank you for joining us. You've nurtured some very significant relationships out there strategically and really have really created a model of best practice for us. So when we think about what you did at Keesler during your time there as the installation commander and also having all of your partners there inside the gate and outside, and then just thinking about the culture there and and the group of people you talked about, you know, some of the retirees and age and different factors. Do you mind sharing a few of your key initiatives and priorities that really help you? We call them court, right? Making that relationship work so that you can really move the needle forward to create a strong partnership from a Jedi perspective. Over to you, ma'am. Sure. I mean, the first thing starts with humility, right? You think uh, as a wing commander, you've been in it for 24 years, you should have all the answers. Um, but I think the first thing, admitting um, to your peers, to your subordinates, to your um, local community, I don't have all the answers. So let's work through this together. Uh, let's be transparent. Um, let's have these crucial discussions um, and uh, let's build that safe space. And so that was extremely critical to do. Giving people a voice was critical. You know, one story um, that I love to tell because it always warms my heart was um, you know, as we continue to uh, explore people's emotions on this and give them a safe space, I would always ask, hey, if you were king for a day, what would you do? If you're a queen for a day, what would we fix? And uh, I had one of my master sergeants, uh, Master Sergeant Stacy, uh, who's from the Mohawk tribe. She said, uh, ma'am, I, I can't put my, my um, heritage on my dog tags. And uh, I didn't understand at first, you know, why that was critical. And she said, if I get killed in, in combat, um, there are certain rites and um, rituals that should be performed over my body, but they won't know to do that. I said, okay, let, let, let's fix this. And sure enough, four months later, the Air Force changed it Air Force wide. Um, down at Keesler, the community partnership also includes our joint partners, um, Army and Navy. They found out about it and changed it DOD wide. So small things like that, giving people a voice, 
um, and listening is, is critically important. Um, when all the tension started to happen, another thing that we did from a community perspective was we met with the um, police chief and the mayor so I was really worried down in Biloxi, Mississippi. Um, I'm worried about my defenders at the gate and I'm worried about my, um, uh, all my airmen going off base. So I met with the mayor and tried to find, are there any locations where I shouldn't send um, my airmen because they're not gonna be supported uh, off base. But as you already heard, um, the mayor looked right at me and he said, Heather, I have not flown um, the Mississippi flag here um, in Biloxi since I've been the mayor. Um, because he knew what that flag represented. And so he wouldn't let it be flown. So he had already set that tone of inclusion within the local community and um, having that conversation, making sure my defenders knew that, um, that uh, we have a great partnership with the local community. There were no riots, there were no protests, there was nothing down there um, because we all communicated and we all were on the same page. The one last thing that I'll throw out there, and I'm, I get very passionate about this, and I, but I don't want to take up um, too much of the conversation. Um, I do want to brag, though, on a pretty neat initiative that um, Air Combat Command um, has also helped support through their SORT Athena program, um, which is actually for our LGBTQ community. Um, they looked at all of the bases across the United States um, where we have Air Force installations. They also then looked at um, all of those, um, the laws uh, in those locations um, and look to see if there are, uh, which bases had um, state laws that um, uh, um, held people accountable for any dis discrimination based on LGBTQ. The map would break your heart. We have our airmen um, going to bases across the CONUS where um, some of those locations still allow um, discrimination based on sexual orientation. Um, and that is another thing, that's another community practice that, um, that, that, that we need to work with. So education um, uh, and um, looking at uh, both the um, uh, um, LGBTQ and race, um, all of it is so critical for our Air Force installations. Hope that answered your question, over. While Felicia unmutes or Stephanie comes on, Heather, we'll, we'll, I'll bring you into some discussion we're doing uh, at the South level that I think what you just said uh, will resonate to the ears of, of multiple people. Um, but we're looking at that exact issue uh, right now. Back to the team. Keep moving on the program. That was the fastest General Adams has ever unmuted. <laughs> Colonel Blackwell, that was absolutely worth the wait. Thank you so much. Talking about creating humility or starting humility at, with, uh, at every level to include the, include the local community, um, transparency, vulnerability, creating a safe space, and the story about the dog tags. That is an absolutely amazing thing to give somebody a voice that echoes throughout the entire Department of Defense. Thank you for sharing that with our group. Um, Next, we're going to move on to Miss Sandy Person to start with her opening remarks. Ma'am, the floor is yours. And I just want to say how humbled I am to actually, I've been participating uh, as an observer in these sessions for a long time, learned so much. And I, when you think it can't get better, it just does. The stories that are shared here and the thoughtful leadership that is presented is just stimulating to my heart. So humble to be here. Um, I thought it might be good for all the folks that are participating. And I see a lot of my AMC uh, brethren, my colleagues. Thank you all for coming in. And, um, you know, great, great to see everyone's involvement in these important discussions. But I thought we could start a little more basic and talk about what is a civic leader and, you know, why are they important? So. The ABCs kind of of that, I'd like to go over and really categorize them as the three W's, um, the who, the what, and the why. So civic partnership is an overlooked tool that a lot of us don't even think to use. And I know um, Katara and Rhonda and Will Rowe and Dr. Reed, we're gonna hear some phenomenal examples of best practices, but let's talk about how these leaders can share their experiences, their perspectives and stories on how we best optimize these important relationships that are often underutilized. Um, who needs to know about civics? Well, 
everyone and anyone on an installation, certainly your squadron commanders, your group commanders, and your wing leadership, but your airmen too, because your airmen are in our communities. And the more we can better understand each other, communicate with each other, we can address a lot of those needs. Um, beyond the honorary commander programs, most installations have those. Local, ci local civics are eager to be a partner in, in, in the voice. And the public affairs teams, when they, when they provide those channels of connectivities, robust opportunity can happen. So what is a civic leader? Well, they're local patriots who have a leadership role in their community typically, but they also have a relationship with your base. They can be business owners, they can be city or county employees or elected officials, but they each have a unique variety of skills, knowledge, and history of local issues that involve your base. Like, hopefully we can talk about scale into discussion because often and the Air Force is a, is, is a big behemoth, right? And everything tends to go to scale and you lose the personal touch when everything you know, is presented in a scaled fashion. So why is all this important? Not all influencers wear a uniform and we are surrounded by su supportive communities generally. And they're there, to, they're volunteers generally, and they're there to invest, engage and advocate for the base. Um, they, offer, they can offer unique insight and have the ability to, to leverage resources differently. And this type of consultation is priceless. Today's Air Force is not the same as it was five, 10, or even 15 years ago. And Air Force leaders that, you know, that fence line is becoming blurred. And Department of Defense and our Air Force leaders are now looking to the community support quality of life initiatives, DE&I strategies, uh, state and local government agencies to help realize cost efficiencies and reduce costs. Funding for installation infrastructure and maintenance has taken a backseat to our mission readiness. And these, these community partners can be an invaluable source of leverage to help get at some of these very, very significant problems. And um, working together, trusting each other is the way that we move this forward. Working together and trusting each other. What a beautiful end to those opening remarks, Ms. Person. Absolutely fantastic. Now, ma'am, I'm going to jump into your question. Uh, and the question is, uh, ma'am, you advise strategic leads within the military and community. When thinking about initiatives you led, and if you can narrow it down, what have been mo the most important three and why? So I want to be provocative in this one. And I put, I love this question. And I could recite three factual initiatives that we've engaged on at Travis. And I've got to give a shout out to my Travis Air Force Base. I've heard Keesler and I heard others. So I want to say uh, proud, proud to be AMC. Um, but I thought this story would, would really be a catalyst for my message here. And the story, I read this recently and I thought how perfect for this discussion. The story was about a Buddhist monk who had been asked to provide his highest words of wisdom uh, to a graduating class. And without speaking word, the Buddhist monk walked into the room, walked to the board and wrote a message on it. And the message was this, everyone wants to save the world, but no one wants to help mom wash the dishes. He went on to say, statistically, it's highly unlikely that any of you will ever have the opportunity to run into a burning orphanage and rescue an infant, but the smallest gestures of kindness, a warm smile, holding the door for the person behind you, shoveling the driveway for the elderly person next door, by that you have committed an act of immeasurable profundity because in each of us, our life it, 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 how'd that go? Our life is our universe. This is my hope for you, that the smallest acts of kindness, you will save another person's world. And I think my translation to that on the initiative is trust and communication, and it has to go both ways. And there has to be sustainable relationships to foster those initiatives. Ta-da!
I already laugh enough when I'm not necessarily supposed to, and you end it with a ta-da. That was beautiful. <laughs> I absolutely love. Thank you, Miss Person. Um, uh, team, uh, we're having some a couple technical difficulties. So myself and uh, my other favorite senior master sergeant in the United States Air Force, Jess, are going to uh, continue <laughs> this tag team. Colonel Burks is having some uh, technical issues. So I, I feel like it's solidarity with Colonel Blackwell. Um, yeah, maybe I just wanted to jump in, Steph. I just couldn't stay quiet, right? Yeah. You know, Sandy, that was awesome. Trust and communication and like small acts of kindness, I think, just make the world change. And we just appreciate those words. Um, amazing. And I can take a note, so I appreciate all of that. We'd like to pass the floor over to um, Dr. Rowe at this time. Well, greetings, everyone. Thank you so much for having me on the panel with all the panelists, with all the participants, and also with my colleague, Carl Reed, who I work with daily on diversity, equity, inclusion efforts inside of Booz Allen Hamilton, but also outside in defense communities and in the faith community. So I'm truly grateful for this conversation. And I'm gonna tell you a short story about my experiences with community partnerships. And I'm gonna end with what I'm doing now around diversity, equity, inclusion in community partnerships, in defense communities. So real quick, my experience with community partnerships actually started back in the 1980s. That's when I was with the Environmental Protection Agency. I was tasked with cleaning up Superfund sites, those radiological and hazardous waste sites. Mine were in Oklahoma and New Mexico, and some of those contaminated were sites. They were on Navajo lands. Some were adjacent to or in underserved and rural urban communities. And one of the uh, JEDI uh, topics that faced me every day when I was in open houses when I held community information meetings and public comment sessions was environmental justice, where the communities were disproportionately impacted by Superfund sites. They needed clean water, clean air, clean land. You know, of course, DOD is dealing with this as well when it comes to contamination on its bases and off and outside the fence line. So then quick, over to 1990, after about a decade of federal service, I joined the private sector. Uh, I was a consultant with MITRE Corporation for six years and the last 26 over at Booz Allen, Hamilton. In 1991, I supported lots of rounds of base realignment and closure for those who remember those days. Every single de de decision really impacted the surrounding communities, some due to closures, some due to realignments and mission growth. I, see, I saw the near-term socioeconomic and environmental impacts to communities during BRAC implementation at many bases and further you know, uh, uh, just experience the importance of community partnerships during installation growth and also installation reuse. And so given that focus, uh, I actually joined the National Association of Installation Developers in 1991, and that became the Association of Defense Communities. So over 30 years now, I've been supporting military installations, and I've been an active member of the Association of Defense Communities, or ADC. I've had the opportunity to support many different efforts to create and expand community partnerships and defense communities through relationship building, through tabletop exercises, education, facilitation sessions, and this years of volunteering. I've seen in the number and types of military community partnerships expand over the years to include compatible land use, snow removal, water supply, solid waste management, recycling, transportation, shared arts centers, cooperative fire training support, medical partnerships, workforce development, and so on. And I've got to thank Fred Muir, one of my dear colleagues, for mentoring me a lot in this area over the years. He is a persistent, patient, humble leader. Anyway, then here's what happened. In 2020, in the summer of 2020, I got a call from the Association of Defense Communities, a 501c3 organization that I'd been part of for like 30 years, asking if Booz Allen could provide pro bono support to a new partnership focus consistent with their mission of creating one community inside and outside an installation. And that was called the One Military, One Community Initiative. ADC leadership in response to the killing of Ahmaud Opry, Breonna Taylor, and George Floyd had pledged to intentionally support defense communities in their local efforts to create more equitable places for all service members and their families to call home. The initiative works through expanded community partnerships and strives to create diverse, equitable, and inclusive defense communities, ensuring that no individual 
in the community faces racism, inequality, or injustice. So when I got the call, having been involved with ADC for a lot of years, doing installation work, and having been involved in DEI in my own company, I said, yes. So I went and obtained pro bono funding from our community impact team. I built a diverse technical team and began supporting ADC. And I'll just name the four areas here real quick. We helped ADC conduct a national survey of military and family members living outside the fence in defense communities to understand their sentiment in the areas of community belonging, community acceptance and support, racial and ethnic inclusiveness, public safety, and structural barriers. The results are summarized in ADC's report called Understanding Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion in Defense Communities. And you can find that on the ADC website under One Military, One Community. It's a 58-page report or based on a survey of about 2,000 respondents who reside in host communities in different parts of the country. And it includes active duty service member responses, veterans, military spouses, domestic partners, and so forth. It provides an initial foundation for understanding community member sentiment towards diversity, equity, and inclusion. And it also analyzes how these perspectives differ by DOD affiliation and race and ethnicity. So that's one thing. The other was we developed a listening session guide for large and small group meetings and worked with ADC to reach out to dozens of defense community leaders offering to support local listening sessions and or conduct local diversity and inclusion surveys to ground local efforts in the experiences of community members. And actually, that's how I met Sandy person. I met Sandy that way. In Northern Virginia, in particular, here's the third thing. Um, we worked closely with the Community Military and Federal Facility Partnership Organization to conduct large group and small group listening sessions specific to diversity, equity, and inclusion. We've been supporting these efforts for about 14 months with the involvement of Joint Base Meyer Henderson Hall, Quantico Marine Corps Base, Fort Belvoir, as well as many different local government jurisdictions, NGOs, chief diversity officers, elected officials, all the participants, Sandy, that you were talking about that's so important, and also Colonel Blackwell. And finally, um, we helped develop the Northern Virginia Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Roadmap, a framework for coordinating efforts and actions in the region that have surfaced through large and small group listening sessions. So let me just conclude um, and just say that just last week, we held a large group meeting of about 75 military and community members and reviewed a new provision in the recently passed National Defense Authorization Act known as Section 1051. This provision calls for DOD to conduct a survey on the relations between members of the armed forces and military communities. And during last week's meeting, which was quite exciting, the Northern Virginia Community Military uh, Partnership agreed to contact DOD to express their interest in not only being one of the covered communities in the survey, but to work with DOD to facilitate local listening sessions, information exchanges, also develop educational campaigns, supplement current efforts that are already going on as part of the roadmap and share best practices and activities. They are actively reaching out to Bishop Garrison up in the OSD and also Cyrus Salazar in the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. So I got to pause. I've run out of time, I'm sure. But uh, Carl Reed's going to tell part two of this story. Thank you very much. Dr. Rowe, wow, thank you for sharing all of that with us. It just really broadens our perspective on what you've been involved in and how partnership works. Um, and we didn't know that you, well, maybe some of you knew, but you and Sandy go way back. So that's pretty awesome. Um, and so we, we had a question for you, if you could talk a little bit more about specifics of Section 1051 in this year's NDAA that you mentioned in your remarks, and why is this so important? Yeah, thank you. I'm really excited that it's there, uh, and I encourage everybody to look at it. And I have to say that the Association of Defense Communities was instrumental in getting it placed into the NDAA. Uh, but basically what it says is that the Secretary of Defense, acting through the Office of um, the Undersecretary of Defense for Personnel Readiness shall conduct a survey of what they're calling covered individuals regarding the relationship between covered individuals and covered communities. And when you boil it down, it's essentially a survey uh, that collects lots of demographic, very important demographic information, not just rank, age, or ethnic, ethnic, um, ethnic and gender demographics, but also uh, conditions regarding health, housing and health care, uh, mental health services, education, and so forth as well as employment opportunities for military spouses, many other relevant issues, uh, including physical safety. 
Um, basically, it, it says that we need to do this at 10 geographically diverse military installations, 10. So that's why Northern Virginia quickly was raising its hand, <laughs> wants to be one of the 10. Um, it also says that as we go through the survey, um, other activities are, need to be carried out. And some of them are listed like facilitating listening sessions and information exchanges, educational campaigns, and supplementing what's already going on and sharing of best practices. So the bottom line, when you read the NDAA, uh, the report that has to be written based on the survey and all the findings from these covered communities has to be presented no later than September 30th, 2023 um, to the committees uh, on armed services in the Senate and the House. So we're not sure exactly where it's gonna land within DOD, but it's there. It's been there about a month or so since the NDAA was passed. And I think it builds on a lot of the momentum that ADC had already started under one military, one community. So thanks for the question. Dr. Rowe, you got me fired up, uh, especially when you said last week's meeting was quite exciting. Anytime anybody references a meeting being exciting, you know you're, you're making changes because meetings are not exciting usually. <laughs> Thank you very much for that insight. Uh, next, we're going to move over to Mr. Reed's opening remarks. Sir, the floor is yours. Well, thank you. What a privilege to be here. I am blown away, beginning with uh, Colonel Blackwell's story. Wow. This is amazing. Let me just say that uh, you, you've already heard Dr. Will talk about the big picture of what we're doing here in Northern Virginia. And it is such a privilege to be working alongside him. He's a visionary. Uh, you can tell by his remarks and he was, I didn't know everything that he just told you. And so it was, it was exciting for me to discover that the pro bono project that I was working on was one that he actually created. Um, so, so my story is I'm a dad. I have three college age kids. I live in Virginia and one of them wanted to go to school in a very, very scary part of the state for me and I didn't want him to go there but he wanted to and we went down there and I said okay but to get there from where I live you have to travel down I-95 and at the time there was this massive confederate flag strategically located to wave over the highway not literally, but you can't miss it. And they were sending a message. And it was a message that I think five years ago, I probably wouldn't have been as disturbed as I was um, since about 2015. And, and of course, it all culminated for me personally with George Floyd's murder. And I am an army brat. I spent my career in the army and I'm working for a consulting company that serves the military. I've been in this DOD cocoon all my life and Truman made it a special place. We were ahead of society overall. We produced a Colin Powell before anybody else did. And yet, and because of that, I believe that you know things were getting better constantly that the bully pulpit would always support those things that were good and right about everything, but especially with regard to race relations. Well, 2020 changed all that for me. It put the, it was a, it was a final piece that told me that, you know, it's been good for you, Carl, but not necessarily for everybody else. And I would said, okay, what do I do about it? And I was fortunate enough to work for a company called Viz Allen that whose chairman took an immediate interest, organized a town hall and said, hey, we got to do something. And eventually I had a town hall and I was asked to tell my story by a young data scientist who said, well, Carl, what's your experience been like? I told him, hey, my experience has been pretty good. But even in my family, I had a brother who was beaten in Cambridge by two policemen just because he was driving while black. They didn't like the fact that he had a West Point sticker on his vehicle and they beat him. And fortunately it happened in front of the, the Harvard seminary. 
So we had witnesses who went to trial. It's a terrible story, but it happened. But even with that, I was able to compartmentalize that most things were getting better. But like I said, recent years, that was not the case. So when I got a chance to work with Will on this pro bono project, it was literally an answer to prayer. I wanted to know what could I do? Where could I serve? How can I contribute? Because I was a beneficiary of the last civil rights movement and it's time for a new one. Well, it was fantastic. And I'll just tell you that uh, the two things that I got to be able to support Will on were these listening sessions. We had large ones that he told you about and we had small ones. And to Sandy's point, while we did all this great policy stuff that's really, really important that went up to OSD that showed up in the NDAA, just as important as we touched individual lives. In the large listening session, we had a woman who came back from overseas and she felt like she had to tell her children about racism to protect them. And she said, I saw the innocence leaving their eyes. I'll never forget that line. And then we did small listening sessions and we had one dedicated just to women service members and veterans. And I heard a heart-wrenching story about something I already knew to be the case statistically, but I didn't have a face for it. It was a story of a senior, senior leader who was forced to have a medical procedure that should have been caught early in life, and it changed the course of her life. And it changed the course of her life because we know that African-American women are dismissed routinely by medical care. It's like an unconscious bias. And we even saw a physician, a black physician, die from COVID who made a video to tell us she as a physician was not being treated properly. And she later died. Those stories in the small and in the large groups were revolutionary. And then, then the next thing that I had wanted to share with you is, Will also introduced me to this faith-based group of different denominations and different cultures of people who share the same desire to see, see progress. And just like the civil rights movement where you have civic partner, partnering with the faith communities, so we have that in what's called the racial reconciliation group. And it was an amazing experience. I will just share one little story. It's about the um, something that I thought was kind of small and therefore, you know, not something big that would revolutionize the world. And I kind of poo-pooed it in my heart, but I supported it anyway. Um, and I found out I was so dead wrong. <laughs> it was, and I, I won't take it any more time because I've talked too much, but let me just say, it was a project where we honored descendants of slaves who were buried in separate cemeteries that were neglected. And there was a woman who as a teenager wanted to do for her family but didn't have the resources she's in her 70s today and this racial reconciliation group like came out of nowhere came alongside her cleaned up the cemetery had this wreath laying ceremony and created a whole new dynamic for that family and the families that are concerned so anyway let me just say it's been an amazing privilege and uh, thank you for having us Carl, you gave me those things where the tears start to start to come out a little bit. That was powerful. It oh is. my goodness, really the is. whole thing, everything you said, um, you don't talk too much. And, and <laughs> as such, I want you to talk some more. I'm going to ask you a question. Uh, so the question is, uh, Mr. Reed, what are the differences between listening sessions and the race, racial reconciliation groups? So they share a lot in common because in both cases, the dialogue is based on listening and learning and humility. Someone said humility earlier, humility. And so in both cases, that is common. And I would say that for the, for the um, 
for the racial reconciliation, what ends up happening in that environment is you have, um, there's also this education component where we start with, a, it's a 12 week series um, that starts with the reconstruction story. And most of us never knew that. We never learned that in school. I mean, I, I didn't, I didn't, I went to school in Virginia and I did not learn it. And all of a sudden you get this understanding of the past, which informs the present and points you towards the future and with solutions. And in the process of doing that, the most amazing dynamic happens and that is called healing. We have some amazing stories of people who show up to listen and learn, to tell their story, and they experience this unbelievable validation, healing, freedom. To to it's like a weight's been taken off their shoulders. It's it's amazing, and that's that's for both sides, right? That's for it's a diverse group. It's 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 minorities and it's it's Caucasians, and everybody experiences that that healing. Thank you, sir. That was actually very enlightening. And I, I got goosebumps. I'm like all into it. I'm taking, again, I tell everybody I'm taking notes because I am. Um, but I really heard you when you said, you know, dialogue, listening, learning, and humility. We have to come to that, whether we've experienced it ourselves, but to sit and listen to someone's story, just that's how we can relate or at least use empathy to understand. And so thank you for sharing that. Um, we are now going to pass the floor to uh, Miss J um, John Jones. So ma'am, she didn't Hi. practice. It's fine. Like, I'm so, I'm so, I'm oh, did so I just, skip one? John, no, it's uh, Johnson Jones. Oh, yeah. I sure, you know, I have, this is why I need my wingman. Thank you. <laughs> Stuff. Awesome. Again, my name is Katara Johnson Jones. And before I get started, I just want to say proud to be AMC. I am, I've just listened to everyone's story. Thank you so much to everyone who's putting this on. And I just am amazed about all the things that are happening. And I am uh, located in Spokane, Washington and in a city where it's not the most racially and ethnically diverse. Um, however, we are very intentional about the work that we do to support Fairchild Air Force Base and be the best community partners that we can be. And I'd like to start, I'll share a little bit of my story and then I'll go into what I wanted to share. I grew up in the inner city of Chicago. My mother had 13 kids. I ended up being stabbed and my artery severed, my hand broken with a bat by Mill Street gang members. Out of 620 freshmen, only 114 graduated. And going, I served five and a half years in the army and typically people from my background did not make it to be an honorary commander and make it to be leaders that are national. And so I just, I say that because growing up in the inner city of Chicago, I saw the impacts of broken systems that fail the same populations of people on a regular basis. And so as I grew into the work that I do today currently, I didn't become the chief diversity officer or top 100 chief diversity officers overnight. I had to look at systems and see how they work so we can find the root cause of failures for communities. And so my question became, where do we go from here? There are several layers in which you sustain diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging work. And one is on the individual side of the house. How do I deal with my own personal biases? The second layer is those that are around us. And how do I do intercultural communication? How do I sustain that practice? And then the next level is where you live, work, and play in that community. And sometimes if you're working in an organization, you could put that layer there and then the outside community. And so when I look at those different levels, I said, where can I do the best work? And that was looking at systems. And in an effort to move beyond commitment in conversations, because these are all great. And the next level is most leaders were asking, well, what do we do now? This has risen to the surface. What do we do now? And so what I did was bring an organizational change, organizational cultural shift 
in a, a clear, practical ways of moving the needle forward and focusing on judgment-free and solution-focused development, communication, and planning. And so I took the skills that I've learned as being a member of the Washington State Department of Enterprise in order to address the systemic inequities in wealth and contracting by taking those partnerships and in the community, creating workshops, connecting state level employees to teach communities that are underrepresented, including veterans, women and minority owned businesses, how to get government contracts as we have 5 million set aside in Washington state every year uh, for these underrepresented populations. And many of the spouses on Fairchild are veterans and a lot of them are have businesses. And so how do I connect that not only in our community in Spokane, but also partnering that with Fairchild. And so the next thing I looked at was the healthcare inequities. And I've partnered and worked with the healthcare, Washington State Healthcare Authority, providing an annual uh, training for uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. And doing those trainings, I've been able to address the stigma as most uh, people of color do not trust the healthcare system because of Henrietta Lack's story from uh, the things that terrible tragedies that happened at Tuskegee. So how do we address behavioral health? And we know that disease and COVID taught us one thing that we are only as healthy as the least healthy in our community. So partnering with the healthcare authority and the peer certified peer counseling program, working with Fairchild to create a compassionate leadership series where it encompasses diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, psychological safety, along with the eight dimensions of wellness, equipping first sergeants to be able to better serve airmen and, and reach them where they are. Uh, the other uh, component is connecting with Pete Carroll, head coach of the Seahawks, working together to create, uh, to present on his compassionate leadership series, but bring in the warrior's edge for uh, active duty personnel who are working with uh, and dealing with the impacts of COVID and learning how to do that self-care to take care of themselves making that connection with my honorary commander at the time to be able to bring that training free of charge for airmen on Fairchild. And the last uh, component is education. I've served on the Washington State Office of the Superintendent Special Education Advisory Council, working closely on inclusion, ensuring, and this inclusion definition is different. It is inclusion by allowing students that identify as 504 plan special education IEP, having integrated inclusion time in general education classes. Because just because a student has uh, a disability or has um, any cognitive delay, it does not mean that they should not be invited into the classroom and having the same standards and, and supports for learning. And it has been really helpful to do that and uh, bring those partnerships and conversations to our work at Fairchild. And last but not least, I serve on the Washington State Supreme Court Minority and Justice Commission, where we look at systemic inequities when it comes to justice and restorative practices and being able to take the best practices there and also roll that into the support with first sergeants who may have a lot of enlisted personnel uh, that may uh, find themselves in the justice system. So how do we, we can't just write people off, but how do we support uh, those, air, or those airmen that might find themselves in those places and working closely alongside the base commander, Cassius Bentley and uh, Chief Guzman to be able to put together not all this compassionate leadership series that, uh, that does training, workshops, and uh, providing specific tools on how to systemically sustain change regarding diversity, equity, and inclusion, because oftentimes we focus on the what is wrong, what happened, but we focus on teaching the solutions. And when we teach the solutions, no one can negate the fact that this is the solution, so we teach that, being judgment-free and solution-focused, and it has had wonderful benefits. And I find myself being able to do some trainer trainer, uh, not just here, but also on the other side of the state with Joint Base Lewis McCord. So bringing that behavioral health components with diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. And so that is uh, what I'd like to share is those systemic 
fair ways to address diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. And it has been an awesome journey. And I look forward to where and, and seeing what best practices we can roll out AMC and eventually, hopefully, enterprise wide. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Johnson Jones. Um, I actually just came from AMC, so I am very excited to hear all of that. I spent um, about eight years there total, so that that is awesome. Uh, something that you that I have to just repeat because it just really got to me was solution focused and judgment free, or judgment free and solution focused. I'm going to use that. I, I love that. We should not be judgmental. Um, we should be focused on solutions. So I think that that's fantastic. We'd also like to ask you another question, ma'am. As an AMC civic leader, team, and honorary squadron commander at Fairchild Air Force Base, you have made direct impact and have immersed in communities to ensure justice, diversity, equity and inclusion around the Fairchild Air Force Base and Spokane, Washington communities. What are some of the initiatives you have led or supported within your community from the JEDI perspective? Ooh, you have time? <laughs> oh, quite a bit. I remember- Ready with my pen. <laughs> Some of the, uh, I, I think it was our, our first speaker, I think it is the last name Blackwell, Blackwell, to make sure, talked about some of those initiatives when George Floyd was murdered, what happened. What I was thinking about in that time, and you can find it online in the news, I realized that most of the youth that were downtown in the Spokane area, they had no place it was just as if there was so much trauma because you imagine a, a children being in school every day and then all of a sudden, all of the teachers that you know are gone. All of the support systems that you have are gone because everyone does not have, uh, we have an equal system, but it's not always equitable. So some for some youth, this is the only place where they receive a, a stable uh, environment without domestic violence. And so looking at these, uh, all of the resources being gone and no after school programs, no way to engage. We saw a lot of uh, 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 protests happening downtown and all of a sudden windows and stores are starting to get broken into. And so I reached out to all of the behavioral health community that I knew in the Spokane region. And I asked all youth counselors and peer counselors to meet me downtown at the park. The next thing I did, I reached out to faith-based leaders and mothers and fathers and, and, and providers in the community. I said, meet me downtown at the park because I didn't have a lot of time. It was no time to plan a major event. And I said, I need a sound system and a speaker system. And they came, people just met me on, from, on Facebook. They came downtown, set up a full speaker system right in the park in front of the wagon. And I remember standing there and I looked at all the kids and I said, uh, some guy came over. He said, hey, you need a DJ? I was like, absolutely. So he comes down with his DJ equipment. And he's over there with his mask and he's bringing the music. And so I reached out to the police officers. I said, hey, I need you to come down here. And I called the mayor and had the mayor down and all elected officials and they sat down uh, down uh, town and they listened to every young person. We called it Youth Declare Yourself Day. My organization, we bought hundreds of dollars worth of pizzas and set it out there so kids could eat and just allowing them. And we brought out uh, art markers. Parents came out, went to the dollar store at all types of places. And they came down with markers just so kids can use posters and art therapy to say and to share their feelings at the moment. And I, I knew that because of the, the climate that was happening, I said anybody that's 25 and under, you can declare yourself today in any way, and we're going to bring the leaders. And for the first time, police officers, kids who had never known each other, teenagers, young adults, dancing together, work, talking together, listening to uh, the police officers and then uh, providing protection. And so what you see the next day after this, I told all the young people, I don't, if you want me to bring elected officials, we did it two days in a row. And for them to listen to what you have to say, do not touch this community, do not break another window. And the police chief can tell you there was, after that day, it was never another broken window happened after that. There were no more gas, uh, 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 gas masks or, or rubber bullets flying at all. 
All of that from building relationships and allowing people an opportunity to be heard, whether you agree or disagree, but allowing the person to be heard, listening to people's story, and then showing something that we all had in common. And it was that we all wanted to, one, get out of the house, and two, we all wanted to be, you know, judged by the content of our character, not the color of our skin. Those are the things that we could all agree on and to be heard. And so to have the next day, the elected officials come down and listen to youth, it just changed the trajectory of what happened in our community. From then on out, large peaceful rallies that happened. And then um, some of the other things that we were able to do and uh, listen in our community is our community uh, meetings and collaborations around education. Education is not just K-12, the continual education for families and people who are not always at the table, invited to the table to learn about ways to change outcomes because we often focus on what services are available, but how do we teach community members how to build generational wealth with housing, how to use the equity inside of your home, those, those um, what the uh, CDC calls uh, the social determinants of health. Every person needs the social access, not just to doctors, but good doctors, access to healthy foods, not just snacks, but healthy foods, access to transportation, jobs and employment, or, or having your own business. And, and um, I forgot the other one, but have all these things every community needs, regardless of the color of your skin. And we often get in these, these conversations where we're fighting about race, but if we can get around those major areas of, when we talk about equity, the major areas uh, that I just spoke of, we can see some real difference and then we can also work on those interpersonal pieces. But until we make sure that every community member has equitable access to the social determinants of health, we will not see systemic change. We'll be at the same crossword road arguing, arguing about the impacts of injustice. And I believe if we start there, we can really move the needle forward. Out. Sorry, over. Out. Out is perfect. Katara, that, I, I, I was sitting here and I was listening and, and I... Um, my heart started feeling something and I was, my brain was trying to figure out the word it was. And I was like, I, I, I respect her. I look up to her. What is this word that I'm looking for? I am so inspired. The, the fact that the, just the willingness to take action and, and don't talk about it, be about it. Let's go to the park. I am just in absolute awe. Thank you so much for sharing all of that, ma'am. Thank you. I appreciate your kindness and compliments. Thank you. Wow. Okay. Uh, Dr. Sonye, did I, did I get it? Uh, so, hey, you're close. Oh, dang it. Uh, you know, I practiced about an hour ago. Um, okay. <laughs> I'm so sorry, Dan. Well, I have to tell you, I am not only inspired, but I feel energized by the speakers that you had. And I'm just so honored to be here with all of these amazing people doing phenomenal work. So just some things that, that's going on at Scott Air Force Base, and that's the area that I represent. You know, we've been working a long time with the community in Scott Air Force Base, well over 40 years. And in so many different capacities, Sandy, myself, so many other people are so proud to be AMC Civic Leader alums. And we've been devoted to that organization and its efforts for a long time. Sandy and I serve as Air Force Civic Leaders working on diversity, equity, and inclusion programs there. And one of the key things that we rolled out in our area to really help the youth of our underserved communities, starting with my high school, which is one of the most underserved high schools here in our region. And we speak to about 45,000 uh, students a year. And Katara, I would love to invite you down to our neighborhood because you are so motivational and had such good ideas that I just wanted to write them all down and I didn't have enough paper. So it was really motivational to hear, but we spoke to you about 45,000 people in our area every year about amazing programs. And the first speaker that we rolled out was General Adams. And he brought his entire team to that high school and he electrified that gym. 
And when he spoke to those students and he brought so many Air Force folks that were just a couple years older than the people who were already in the stands, it motivated people to look at careers in cybersecurity and other areas that they had no idea about. And so bringing opportunities to people who would have never even thought about those opportunities before had been something that we really wanted to do and having just the support of the military to get there was really critical. Another big program that we worked on was um, transitioning airmen and helping them to locate jobs in our area after um, they had completed their military service. And people love to hire military folks because of their expertise and their willingness and their leadership. But you know, the Airmen and Family Readiness Center chief brought to me an issue that I wasn't really thinking about. She said, but what about all the military spouses? They need help. They need help finding jobs. Licensure is a huge problem. And so this was way back in 2015, 16 kind of time frame. And so we started looking at the licensure, not only in our state, but in other states. And it was sad. Portability was tough. If you're moving from duty, duty station to duty station, not an easy thing back then to transition your professional license. And it really held military spouses back. And it was a very difficult process, to say the least. And then you had associations in all of these states that were professional associations, unions that required them to take tests, more classes, certifications, pay more fees, you know, continue with requirements. It was so daunting. I don't know how a military spouse could ever even navigate those waters without, you know, just being incredibly frustrated. And they're not in some of these locations very long. So it became a process of just timing. You're not there long enough to even accomplish the classes that they're asking you to do. And so really started looking at that issue um, from an AMC civic wide perspective, started talking with a lot of military spouses. And in talking to the business community, they really looked at the military spouses as temporary workers. Even though they brought immense skills to the table, they said, hey, you know, they're not going to be here long enough. So they're sort of a temporary workforce, which really meant lower pay, career stagnation, regression, lack of employee benefits like retirement. So it was a huge, huge problem. And the more we talked to military spouses and understood their frustrations, the perceptions in the marketplace, and just, you know, some of the requirements that each state had that were all different because licensure is a state issue. It was just so daunting that we really wanted to take that on for our military spouses and understand it and really, you know, started to develop that compelling story and focused on our first big initiative, which was teacher reciprocity. Why teacher? Well, our state at that time had a teacher shortage and they have a teacher shortage today. So we thought, well, if we're going to try to figure this out, let's take on the teacher reciprocity first. And that was one of the things we started talking with all our legislators, had our military spouses talk to legislators. And let me tell you, when you hear the story from a military spouse of all the things they've had to endure in all the duty stations they've been in, it is so incredibly compelling. You, can, you have to help. You just have to help them get through that terrible situation and get to a better place. And so that enabled us to really put together a compelling story and legislation. And in our state, which is a deeply divided state, we had a unanimous vote, bipartisan vote on that legislation, which helped us set a foundational platform for the next piece. So we went back to the Department of Licensure and said, how many other licenses are there? And they said 110. <laughs> we thought we can never take these on one at a time. We're going to have to bundle these together. <laughs> and so that's exactly what we did. And we started the same coalition building process across the state with all of the other military branches and all of the other military installations and really work that system from a coalition building point of view. And once again, on the second piece of legislation, even though it was more difficult with a lot more licenses, we also once again got a unanimous vote because when military spouses speak, they bring power to the audience. 
And that is what I would say, if you are trying to get licensure done, have the military folks speak. To date in 2020 and 2021, in the state, we've already helped over 860 folks get their licenses just in that short period of time. And you know, that is, that is just a huge plus for the Illinois Department of Regulation who embraced it, took it on, and really made it their own. You know, a lot of laws are passed and they're not supported, they're not funded, they're not really implemented in the way you'd hoped. But here, that department, embraced it and said, you know what, we're going to develop pamphlets, we're going to hire a military liaison to shepherd these applications through, we're going to be in contact with bases, and did a whole lot of other things with their website and some other things to make it smooth for those military spouses to apply and get through. And you know what, we have a really great system. Now, we just had to put some recent um, legislative um, fixes um, in our in our uh, law to to just clean up some legislation because as time has went on it's evolved and so we had to just upgrade ours to meet all the other but I want to give a big shout out to the AMC civic leaders who are on this phone call because as we were going through the process as a big AMC civic leader family we shared legislation legislation process contact helped each other helped each other states to get through it and so it's been a real journey helping people, but it's one of the things that we find, I think, as an AMC family and bases, just, you know, being part of that family has been hugely rewarding. Thank you, ma'am. We have a question for you. What can the DOD do to help state legislators, licensing agencies, and community partners to more effectively address DOD's desired statewide laws in relationship to military licensure and interstate licensing compacts? You know, one of the big things I would say to get that call to action is tell a compelling story where military spouse licensure is, is such an, a critical thing to be addressed with clear and consistent outcomes. So when we started this process, it's changed. When we first started military content, other states came up with better content than it was like, oh, we need to move to that because they have better content. If we knew in the beginning what the desired outcome was, then it would have been far easier because to do, you know, legislation takes a long time and a lot of people have to get on board with that. So if we had consistent and clear outcomes that the DOD would like to accomplish then that would make it far easier for us to develop a compelling story to meet that and exceed the expectation of the DOD instead of kind of having an evolutionary process where you have to keep going back and fixing our legislation and upgrading it as it continues to evolve. And that would help the military spouses. You know, when you are looking at interstate compacts and what's important about those is that you have a large group of states that have similar are the same type of legislation that you can, you know, transfer your license from one state to another and have that portability fairly easily. Well, what an amazing thing. Why aren't we doing that? That's a fantastic thing to do, not only for military, but in some of the other career fields for, and there's a lot of compacts out there for nursing and some of the other, other major fields, but, you know, that's really important to do something like that. The challenge tends to come in that it is a state's right to do licensure and so it gets a little complicated but interstate compacts is an amazing answer to helping helping military spouses to transition from one state to another very easily and so having that clear and consistent what the outcome is is really important and that's what we hope to maybe achieve in the future. Wow, that's awesome. We can all relate, I'm sure, in one way or another with those, with our spouses and with the licensures. Um, I know my husband is a civilian, so that was one reason why he made the decision to go his path that he did, because we knew it would kind of be difficult. So thank you for sharing that and what we need to do um, to help make those changes. And thank you for everything you've been doing in the community. Um, I think it's over to you, Steph. Oh. <laughs> I think it's over to you, Stephanie, uh, for the chat. Hopefully you have some awesome questions in there for these great panel members. So over to you, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, wow. Wow. What a great panel. What an incredibly insightful and motivating panel, too. 
Um, this is one of those panels where we get to hear uh, powerful commentary and also some, some good news. Um, Dr. Rhonda is what I'm going to refer to you as. You said something. Uh, you said um, the exact phrase, I think, close. You just have to help them. And I think that really just captures uh, the passion I see from every single one of our panel members today. Um, you just have to help them. And, and, and it, it, whatever, it's like fill in like spouses or, or, or this education system, or you have to be vulnerable and transparent and create a community. This has just been a fascinating and incredibly powerful pa panel this evening. Um, before we go into chat questions, General Adams, do you want to say anything? Uh, no, let's just continue to press. I think hopefully we got a lot of folks who want to uh, ask some of our uh, panelists questions and we'll wrap up uh, after this. Thank you. Perfect. I was hoping to stall for at least a minute and that a chat question would come in. So team out there, all 99 participants, I'm ready for your questions. And so is the panel. Hey, so Stephen, you don't have Stuff, right? I always have stuff. We have one now. Oh. There's one now. Uh, I'm about to go to so, so Bree Fulton should come on the mic and ask something. But go ahead, wherever you have up. Okay, uh, from Kimberly, the DoD has established standards for license portability. How does the community suggest the civic leaders lead in license portability? The Air Force was the first to establish a standard, but the others will follow shortly. How you treat families will affect your community through future missions or keeping missions. Um, does, uh, does anyone want to take this? I think we covered a little, a little bit from Scott Air Force Base perspective. I'm happy to jump in for a minute, just a perspective. And I know Kimberly is a great advocate of this cause in the um, Scott Air Force Base area. So big shout out to her and to Rhonda. I think what's fair to say is that the Department of Defense and the Air Force are, um, looking, are, are looking to the communities to be a partner in affecting change. And that's kind of a new thing. Um, you know, this hard line fence and what goes inside, you know, what goes on inside the fence has not been super transparent to communities. And I think we can't, uh, you know, the past five years have been very dynamic in changing that landscape. But I think it's, you can't just dismiss, you know, 75 years of that culture of what goes on. And it goes back to, and this is General Adams, the top three things you need to do, listen, learn, and love. And you know, you hear other leaders say, listen, learn, and lead. And I think as community members are trusted and can be viewed as a real partner, cultures don't always intersect um, fluidly. And you get someone like a Katara or a Dr. Rhonda or Will Rowe and, and Dr. Reed, they, you bring these amazing stories of perspective. I think what's most powerful is when people trust their voice and the story to say those truths. And we don't do that enough in the Air Force. You got it, your voice is powerful. And we need to hear more of that because that's what moves us. It's what moves me and inspires me every day. And I want to lay down for you. So continue to share that and exercise that voice because it moves mountains. Thank you, Sandy. Um, uh, Colonel Blackwell threw a question in the chat in, in regards to this topic. And then the question is, is license portability part of the base scorecard? got a head nod yes it is absolutely and that came out in 2018 um you know the secretary um chief wrote a letter to all the governors of all 50 states uh bringing this component licensure portability and the uh schools the quality of schools into future basing decisions it has it, it there's talk of expanding some of those parameters now to other you know components of quality of life issues because they have really been encouraged by the massive movement i think it isn't it three quarters and will you may know Rhonda, you may know three quarters of the states have now adopted um you know um progression in licensure reciprocity so it's it's been effective. It's been 
been very effective, but I think one of the things early on that would have been helpful is a little bit more clear and consistent what the outcome was, you know, what they would have liked to have seen that way states that were early to the process would have been able to really jump in a little bit more in terms of what the content should have been that they were moving ahead in their states. And so, you know, I think that they've, um, that that's getting much better over time and, you know, got to continue to work on that along with anything else that's being done relationship wise. Thank you. Thank you both very much. Um, Brianna has her hand raised. Great. Hello, this is Colonel Brianna Fulton. Uh, sorry, I am driving, but I do want to jump in and have uh, you all expand upon the uh, comments of uh, what you just stated regarding expanding the sex step letter for communities as we assess spaces. And it's a two part question as we are looking at various um, mechanisms to evaluate and measure the effectiveness of spaces as well as those surrounding communities, uh, looking at inclusive cultures as well as some of the things that may have been previously identified. If you could state uh, what would be uh, some additional things you all would recommend uh, having added to that in the evaluated process. And then um, I believe one of you mentioned um, you would have appreciated if we had stated more clearly in that response what the outcomes you were looking for, if you can expand upon that. Is there a panel member that would like to jump on that one? You know, I can I can certainly talk to the issue of the content for licensure um, legislation. In the beginning, when we first started working on this, it wasn't very clear exactly what, what that content needed to consist of. Um, and so that was um, something that we all had to kind of work through. And as certain states passed legislation and we helped other states in the AMC family to adopt better legislation, you know, it, it progressed, it evolved, and that's a fantastic thing. But it would have been, I think, helpful to some of those early states that passed legislation to know maybe what the end game was so that, you know, it could have been a little bit more consistently um, uh, easier for the states who were kind of in the beginning rather than having to come back and continuously clean up the legislation. But I think that would have been very helpful. And um, I was wondering if either Mr. Um, Will Roll or Mr. Carl Reed, could Carlton Reed could speak to the work that they did and specifically um, the surveys that were conducted, if those would be beneficial um, as a means of looking at more evaluation criteria for assessing how well basic communities are doing. I can start on that just a little bit. Thank you for the question about surveys. Um, we conducted some local surveys um, in Alabama, in Huntsville uh, for the Chamber of Commerce. Um, we offered to do, and uh, I think did a small survey in Montgomery, Alabama for the Chamber there. Also for Eastern Connecticut uh, Chamber of Commerce uh, around the Naval uh, installation up there. Um, some communities um, are surveyed out. <laughs> They've had too much surveying and they just want to move on uh, with discussion and action. Uh, other uh, communities are actually uh, hesitant uh, to do surveys. Um, it's something they haven't done before. Um, I think at some point um, the community needs to step up um, and help, help lead the, uh, the creation and the distribution of surveys that are tailored locally to the questions that really need to be asked. You know, we took the national survey questionnaire and we tailored it to Huntsville. We tailored it to Montgomery and up to Eastern Connecticut. Um, the installations at the time we did these local surveys were a little hesitant to push it out. I have to be candid. Uh, it was that time uh, a year ago or six months ago when even to some extent today, we don't wanna push this out, let the community do it. Uh, but I think it was beneficial 
Um, of course, when each community wants to compare itself to the others, am I doing better or worse? We don't, we don't encourage that. We just want them to look at their own data. But combine that information with the listening steps. Combine it with the partnership. Combine it with what you're hearing from military spouses and domestic partners, active military and veterans. Uh, get all of the voices to add to the survey. Um, that's sort of what ended up being most beneficial, I would say, in Northern Virginia. Because once we put it all together, we could organize what we were hearing. And we could say, there's some systemic issues here. Um, and we looked at housing and affordable housing. We're still looking into that. And how do we move that to action? That's why we put it in our roadmap. And then who do we need to work with to address the vulnerabilities that exist in affordable housing or K-12 education or food insecurity? Um, so I find that it's just a piece of the puzzle, the survey. Uh, and uh, candid candidly, we could do, uh, be happy to do on a volunteer basis, a, a tailored survey for any of the regions represented here. Um, it's very straightforward and we can compile the re results and you get a briefing, but add that to your, your, uh, your listening and to that humility that's required to, to really understand the, uh, the real voices, the real sentiments that are out there. Uh, but turn it quickly into the roadmap, into the plan that has action, and then move those actions forward because you build relationships by work and service together. You build uh, trust by actually being allies and working together on a really tough problem or even a starting it. Uh, to address it. Carl, I don't, I don't know if you want to add, but I just turn, turn it over to you, see if you want to add anything. Yeah, well, I just add one thing. And that is one of the benefits is that it reveals to the leaders or whoever is reading the survey information they may not otherwise know. We found a very, very clear disconnect between how minorities in general and African-Americans in particular viewed each question. And for those who thought that things were pretty good and that everybody felt pretty good about things, it was an insight, it was an eye-opening moment and useful for informing why it's important to take the next steps. Leaders, I have terrible news. It's 2104 where I live, which means we've already come to the end of the main portion of Crucial, Crucial Combo. Um, this has been just amazing. <laughs> Thanks, Andy. I'm going to pass it over to Jess uh, for our closing. We're going to end the, end the main portion, but everybody sit tight for uh, overtime if you're available to stay, and please start posting some questions in the chat. And if you haven't looked at the chat, there is wisdom in the chat. Wisdom. <laughs> there is wisdom in the chat. Please take a look. All right, Jess, over to you, ma'am. All right. Thank you, Stephanie. I appreciate it. Thank you for each of you that have um, participated tonight. At this time, we will allow the panelists to offer closing remarks and then offer time for departure for those leaders who need to leave the discussion at that time. Um, we'll start off with, in the order that we started in. So Colonel Blackwell, if you'd like to start us off with closing remarks, that would be great. Sure, you bet. And I'd actually just put it in the chat as well. And I just want to say um, thanks, everybody, for doing this. Great conversations, um, and every little bit matters. So please keep the conversations going. Um, and uh, I, I love the, the part of uh, you know, the small things, the small things. Make the grass beneath your feet greener. We got this. We can do it out here. Guess that's me next. Um, yes, ma'am. Words of wisdom, boy. Lean in, be authentic in that leaning in, show who you are, reveal yourself. I love that word. Um, and, you know, be vulnerable because that's how we learn, that's how we grow. And, you know what? I, I wasn't the typical profile of a civic leader. When I started this, I was I looked a little different. I'm glad there's so much diversity now. But when I started this, I don't know how seriously I was taken. And I don't know that I took myself seriously in it. But you know what? I kept I, I, I kept asking, I kept leaning in. And the reward has been tenfold 
what I expected. So for every bit of inspiration you give me, um, you know, I try to take that and, and, and be a force factor of 10 on it. So thank you for the privilege of participating tonight. I'm inspired. I love the stories. They're so moving. I wish I had a good story like that. Thank you. And for Will, some of thoughts in my mind, but I would just say that our conversation started with humility and listening and building understanding, learning what you don't know. But boy, once you do that, um, you, you have a mindset change. Um, and you begin to think about what's possible uh, and what needs to be done. And, and I want to go back to something, Sandy, you said, is there really a fence there? You, know, you almost have to think about there's not a fence there. And what's the art of the possible that you can do um, by being persistent, by persevering, by, by partnering, by building trusted relationships and moving together uh, and then turning these, these, these uh, needs into collaborative responses and, and actions. And to use Carl's word, healing. I mean, there's real healing that can happen in community, even in small groups, maybe even in large groups and, and with individuals. So uh, I'm just so um, motivated uh, to be part of this. Thank you so much. I'll just I'll just quickly add just echo one of the words that I've heard a couple of people say and we'll just said it. It's action. The conversations are critical, but they need to translate to action. And uh, in that working of projects together, as Will also said, you build those relationships, and those relationships are powerful. It feels like a standoff. So, uh, Katara, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> I would say sometimes we make the simple complex, and I like simple things. And so, what I like to say is ask a simple question who's missing? When you're making a decision, where you're coming up with a plan, asking who is missing from this conversation? Because oftentimes the people who make the decisions that are not the ones who will be impacted by that decision. So making sure that those community members and then those that will be directly affected by the, 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 the decision or change, make sure you have an interdisciplinary team of, of people that you're listening to. And uh, the last thing I would say is assume that there is an issue the best practices, organizationally, research-based best practices, they're all out there. So implement the solution. Too often we start, we focus too much time on this is the problem, this is what it looks like. So let's assume that there's a problem and let's build in a solution and not allowing training, oftentimes a DEI training is separate but equal. Embedded in everything that you do because it already is. And when you serve airmen as diverse as, as the fingerprints of every person in the world, you can't afford not to. And oftentimes, uh, and focus on your communication, how you roll it out, because at the end of the day, at least communicate things in two to three different ways because just because you're communicating doesn't mean that a person is comprehending. Communication and comprehension are two different things. So making sure that you are reaching people where they are, especially when you have English as a second language. And yes, we have airmen from around the world and their spouses are from around the world, but we still communicate in the same ways. We have to do things differently. And change is external, but transitions are internal. So also focus on the internal with your airmen and their families. That's all I have. Last but not least, is she ready? <laughs> Let me. Yes, ma'am. All right, I'm ready. Well, one of one of the things that I think is motivational about this evening is, you know, just do it, people. 
I heard an awful lot of people that said, I'm going to jump in and help. I'm going to jump in and take on the issue and make things happen in a positive way. That's really what you need to do. And that's that's incredibly important. And I know when I was working with the Airmen and Family Readiness Center chief and we were working on transitioning airmen and she said, what about military spouses? They really need help. You know, it's it's good to have so many people in our community that were willing to jump in and help because it was a real issue. Even in the beginning when there wasn't a lot of things written about, um, you know, the precise activities and that only happened over time. But I think, you know, being able to engage and be a part of it and want to be part of the solution and having a plan, it's just really critical. And so I would encourage all of you to don't be afraid of challenge, take it on. You know, that's how you get somewhere. You may not know all the answers, but if you put enough great people together, you'll figure that out. Awesome. Thank you all for those closing remarks. And thank you to the, those of you that joined us today. I hope that you all got something from it. I know I have, and we need to take it back and make some of those changes. I hope something sparked for conversation within our organizations and outside of the gate as well. If you would like to be a part of our distro list and are not yet, we did put it in the chat as well. So just take a look um, and thank you. And please mark your calendars for the next Crucial Combo on 15 February of this year. And I believe we're going into overtime. Is that right, Stephanie? Overtime, See, uh, Chief Ball, see, uh, General Adams, do you have anything before we pop into overtime? Uh, just big thanks for all of the team, the team members that's on. So to our panel, you know, thanks for coming in. We appreciate, you know, your time here um, tonight. Uh, I, I have a list of notes as well for a lot of great uh, conversations. So we do appreciate it. I was concerned about having this many uh, guests on, but we came up with a format you know, that worked. So we do appreciate that. Um, there's something that probably we should probably do a deep dive in some of the unique conversations we've had, but we'll save that for another time. Uh, to the, the Crucial Convo crew, my Triple C crew, appreciate you all for what you all have done tonight, uh, rolling in a new kind of person that we had up front, uh, doing a narration for the first time, did an outstanding job. Uh, and then for everybody who put together the format in the background, uh, to execute this. We appreciate, you know, all of your work as well. Uh, as we are looking at, you know, this uh, month of January, February, uh, highlighting the importance of community, uh, what does community mean and how can we leverage community? It's a great opportunity to have some friends that I would call them this on that I've been, you know, partners with for years. Uh, I've been with uh, Rhonda and Sandy that I've known, Tara too, and then bringing in, you know, uh, Colonel Blackwell, who's part of my 17 Delta or 17X tribe. Uh, we appreciate her long uh, participation in cyber and leading the, the men and women down there at Langley and across uh, ACC. And then to my new friend that I've just made there with Booz Allen Hamilton, with, uh, Carl and Will, uh, thank you for the partnership. Look forward to joining your racial reconciliation group. Um, on Wednesday, this weekend, and the following week as well. So just want to say big thanks to each one of you all. Um, as we see where we are in the state of America, I will ask each one of you uh, a, 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 a few questions. One is, you know, do you want to be right or do you want to be happy? Do you want to be right or do you want to live in peace uh, with your fellow American? Uh, and that's going to take some compromise, right? So even the things that we talked about not tonight, the one thing that we often miss oftentimes, I look at who's in the room sometimes uh, and who joins in on Crucial Convo, I want to create, uh, increase our white male population to join these conversations. Uh, that's what I ask each one of you all to do. You can help me by reaching out and ensuring that you bring somebody uh, to this that, that doesn't look like you. That'd be great, right? Because that voice, as, as, as uh, uh, JJ said there, as a um, we have to look around and say, who's missing? Who is missing from this conversation, right? And no matter what we believe or understand, I would rather we move forward in peace uh, than move uh, you know, forward individually or move forward with just half of the population because that is dangerous in a polarizing you know, nation that we have. So we have to be deliberate. Uh, we have to be in a state of compromise as we move forward. 
um, because I think, you know, our nation could be ripped apart if we don't think strategically uh, about uh, where we're going. So to me, that is move forward together. That is my thing, forward together. Uh, and each one of you all, as Heather kind of stated, you know, you know, making the grass greener around you. I use, you know, uh, drops in the ocean, creating waves of change um, because everybody can make a drop in the ocean. Um, you may not, and, and I get this whole thing about can't, can't boil the ocean, uh, but we can boil it one part of the time. We, we can boil it individually. We can't do it by ourselves, but everybody can get a pot and heat it up, right? So heat up your part of the ocean uh, around you, your area, uh, your family, uh, and don't do it over social media. Go knock on somebody's door, right? Um, you'd be surprised. You might be talking to a Russian, somebody from China anyway when you try to do that. We have to be smarter than our adversary who will use the nation's fundamental flaws to wedge an American against another American. That's just how things work. And we have to be smarter than that. Be smarter than your own hate. Um, be smarter than whatever your lights are. You have to move forward together as a nation. So I'll end with that. Uh, we'll go into overtime. We uh, hope that you all will stick around for our panel members if you have you got to go and do family things. We created overtime to give you all a break uh, so you wouldn't be here forever, but to give some of our you know, faithful listeners an opportunity to continue to engage in the topic. So panel members, if you can stick around, uh, we appreciate it. But if you can, uh, we want to honor your time and bid you a farewell. Uh, join in again on next, uh, the, our next conversation, the 15th. So we're nice and not going to do this on Valentine's Day, which is the Monday but shift into that Tuesday. Uh, some of you are gonna be spending time with your loved ones. So we'll be back here on Tuesday the 15th and where we hope to have a detailed conversation about what's going on there uh, in Montgomery, Alabama. Uh, I'm from Tuskegee, Alabama and I was just in Montgomery doing an MLK speech. So we wanna be able to bring those folks in to talk about what's going on uh, in the state of Alabama and around Montgomery. Uh, we hope that's gonna be a lofty and robust kind of conversation. Uh, if you, we can bring up that slide so everybody can see. Thanks, Heather. We see you got a roll. Uh, but we wait for the mayor to respond. If you know about Jess Mercy and the EJI Institute, so Brian Stevens, uh, we reached out to him and waiting on a response from him. Uh, and then we have an AMC, uh, AETC civic leader along with the, uh, the Montgomery Chamber Council uh, that's there. So those are the folks that we bring in. So that's what we've uh, sent out the invitation to right there, which you see in front of you. Uh, we'll keep you posted as we shear up those individuals uh, to have an opportunity to come and speak. All right, what, any other slides? I saw the slides. Do you have any other important slides we need to show, team? All right, uh, Felicia, I don't know if Felicia's on, but I know she has some tech difficulties. Uh, we're starting a book club kind of book review. So we're going to be looking at this book uh, for this first quarter. So if you haven't had the book, we'll take some time to uh, go into one of our sessions and talk about Renee, Renee Brown's book. Uh, Atlas of the Heart and hope you will join us. Many of the conversations tonight have talked about how you can be vulnerable, how you bring your heart to leadership. Uh, and this is our opportunity to have a, a discussion about that. Next slide. Another book that we're looking at coming up by Adam Grant, uh, Think Again, a wonderful opportunity to dive deep and in, in looking at uh, what you may think is true. And I think even somebody tonight talked about this. So uh, your panel members, you were spot on even in your remarks. Uh, and how your remarks relate to the books that we have coming up next. All right, here are some awards that we know that are coming up. Uh, we kind of updated this slide just so people can be aware of the awards uh, that are coming up uh, as well. Next. All right, so we're into the discussion. I'll pause to see if any other team.